Good morning. Or, uh, today I'm going to introduce you to igneous rocks and volcanism, which is uh, lab number four. Now, some of this material I've covered, at least uh, in lecture, but I want to make sure I give you a brief overview of the specifics that you need to know to help facilitate the understanding of the lab and ensure that you complete the lab in the hour and 40 minutes that you're in the laboratory. Now, the first thing we want to get across here is igneous rocks. Uh, you might remember that igneous rocks are those rocks that are formed directly from crystallization from a magmatic melt. Now, igneous rocks can crystallize both above the ground, such as uh, shown in this PowerPoint slide. You can see a lava uh, that is cooling at the surface. This lava happens to be basaltic in composition, uh, but it's crystallizing at the surface. Magmas can also crystallize below the surface. And so the important thing we're looking at today in Igneous Rock Lab is we're going to look at two aspects of igneous rocks that will facilitate the classification. One is going to be the composition, and that's going to be largely uh, controlled by the source of the magma. Did it start as a partial melt of the asthenosphere and upwell to form ocean lithosphere, which is comprised of basalt? Was it the result of subduction of ocean uh, basalt? and partial melting of the ocean lithosphere to create intermediate composition, or was the result of continental collisions where maybe uh, partially melted continental crust. And so that would uh, facilitate uh, the three different compositional characteristics we'll be looking at today. The second component will be textures. Did it crystallize above ground or below ground? And remember very simply, the, if it crystallized above ground, it's cooled very rapidly. You're going to have finer textures, smaller minerals, if it crystallized below ground, it will have cooled slower. You'll have coarser textures. Now, if we're looking at the compositional characteristics of igneous rocks, we can classify them into three basic compositional forms. Basaltic and acidic and granitic, which you can see here shown by these three pi diagrams. Now, if you were taking an advanced igneous petrology class, there would be a lot more subdivisions you would have subdivisions that might fall in between, okay, basalts and andesites and subdivisions that fall in between andesites and granites. But for the purpose of our introductory class, we're just going to learn the three basic subdivisions, and I will introduce one additional subdivision right here in between granite and andesite. Note the compositions of the three uh, magma types and the three major compositions of these rocks are defined largely by silica content. Basalt is about 50% silica content. Uh, andesite is about 65%. And we get over to granite, and it can be as much as 70% silica. Now, one thing I want to get across here, when we're mentioning silica content, I mentioned this in lecture, silica content does not equate to quartz content. Quartz is a mineral that is comprised of 100% silica. But you know that in basalt, there's no quartz, or typically there's no quartz. Uh, the silica content you see in basalt is the silica tetrahedra that are found in the other minerals, like pyroxene and calcium rich plagioclase. Very important to remember that. The other important thing to note compositionally is as silica content goes up, the iron magnesium content goes down. And iron magnesium, there's the brown, and the light orange is shown right here. That's iron magnesium. And note that in a granite, that iron magnesium content is inversely related to the silica content. Now, once you know the silica content and you know the composition, uh, you'll note that there are some other properties related to properties of lava or magma that are important and relevant to the uh, slope angles of the volcanic landforms that are relevant to the explosivity of the volcanic eruptions. And uh, one of these major components is viscosity. Viscosity is defined as the resistance to flow. And so high viscosity lavas tend to be very thick and sluggish. They have a high resistance to flow. Viscosity, as you remember, we discussed in lecture, is dependent upon silica content and temperature. The viscosity is directly related to silica content, meaning that the higher the silica content, if you look here, the rhyolitic magma, has a very high silica content, it has a higher viscosity. The basalts have a very low viscosity because they have a very low silica content. Note that viscosity units are shown logarithmically, that they are not a linear scale because there's such a diverse variation in the uh, high, excuse me, the magnitude of viscosity.
The other important to note here is temperature. The temperature of the lava is inversely related to viscosity. The higher the temperature, for instance, basalts have higher melting temperatures than rhyolites, you're going to have lower viscosities. And so we'll come back to viscosity at the very end of this, uh, this preview lecture. We talk about explosivity of volcanic eruptions. Now, where do basaltic composition magmas form? And uh, remember, we talked about four different tectonic settings. You can get basaltic composition magmas anywhere you have partial melt of the asthenosphere. That can be at a mid-ocean ridge spreading zone, which is shown here. That could be a, a mantle hot spot, shown here, like the Hawaiian Islands. You can also get partial melt of the asthenosphere behind uh, the subduction zone, here in a back arc spreading basin, like the Columbia Plateau, or the Sea of Japan, or the Korean Sea. Both those uh, geographic terms have been used to describe the same body of water. You can also, believe it or not, get some basalt sometimes leaking up to subduction zones itself. You get extension and sort of as the magma rises and causes the uh, overriding crust uh, to rise and extend, you can get some basalt that might leak up along some of these extensional cracks. Remember when we're looking at basalt, that it tends to have a low viscosity, but as basalt begins to cool, uh, it can begin to re attain a higher viscosity. In this case here, we can see two different properties of basalt flows. The Pahoy Hoy flow, the ropey texture one, is the lower viscosity uh, basalt flow that forms initially as the basalt is erupted from the vent. As the basalt begins to cool and degas, its viscosity rises and it gets a more blocky textured. Remember, ah, ah flow, and I mentioned in lecture, think of walking on it and going ah, ah, ah to remind you of which uh, flow type represents uh, the uh, higher versus low viscosity characteristics. Now, if we're looking at the intermediate compositioned igneous rocks, we talked about those forming at subduction zones. This is your andesitic composition uh, as far as lava types are concerned. Here, we're looking at a partial melt of the ocean lithosphere, which is being subducted. Along with that subducting ocean lithosphere, you have marine sediments being taken down, ocean water is also being taken down, and as this gets subducted, you start to squeeze the water out of the subducting plate. That's going to lower the melting temperature, enhance melting, and that partial melt is going to rise to the surface. It gets erupted along volcanic vents along these subduction zones both in ocean-ocean convergent margins, such as Japan, or ocean-continental convergent margins, such as the Cascade or the Andes Mountains. Now, one thing that we note here is, as I mentioned, uh, the intermediate composition rock is described as anisite. I want to introduce a second intermediate composition magma or lava type. And the reason I bring this up is if you look at Mount St. Helens, you're going to find when you go to Mount St. Helens, as you have over the past few weekends, that there, the rock type for Mount St. Helens is dacite. Well, it turns out that andesite and dacite are both intermediate composition rocks. The only difference we're looking at here is andesite is slightly more mafic than dacite, which is slightly more felsic. And so dacite would have higher silica content in it, lower iron magnesium content in it. Okay, they're both intermediate composition magmas. And so here we see Mount St. Helens. It's also an intermediate composition subduction zone volcano, but it has slightly higher felsic content, likely because there's been some con crustal contamination as, as the magma rose up through the North American plate, you had some contamination from the higher silica content continental rocks. Here we can see uh, in the case of subduction zone volcanism where we have uh, the magmas crystallizing underground, you end up with a coarser grained uh, volcan excuse me, igneous rock. And this igneous rock we see here comprising El Capitan in the Sierra Nevada is granodiorite. And granodiorite, it turns out, is the coarse grained equivalent of dacite. And we'll get to that in a little bit more detail. Okay? So those are your intermediate composition magmas forming from subduction zones and partial melting of the ocean lithosphere and including marine sediments and squeezing out of water and water lowering the melting temperature. Now, when you have continents collide, we get partial melt of continental crust. And remember, continental crust has an average composition like andesite. 
So now we're partly melting andesite. When you partly melt andesite, as we've been discussing all quarter, you separate the melt phase from the solid phase. The melt phase is going to have a different composition than the solid phase that remains behind. So when two segments of continental crust collide, you get partial melting. Partial melting of the andesitic composition continental crust forms granite. So granitic composition magma is generated from partial melt of continental lithosphere. Now, you can see uh, this partially melted continental lithosphere if you visit the Appalachian Mountains in uh, Vermont or New Hampshire or any of the other states that have the Appalachian Mountains present along the eastern margin of the United States. And here's a quarry uh, that is located in Vermont. And you can see this granitic quarry here. You have these extensive granitic rocks uh, being comprised in this area of the Appalachian Mountains. This is the old plutonic core that underlay the Appalachian Mountains. Just like the Cascades, just like the Himalayas, many of these mountain ranges, of course, have plutonic bodies that are incorporated in their cores. And the Appalachians, as you know, formed over 300 million years ago. You've had, con you've had continued uplift of the Appalachian and weathering and erosion, now exposing these old granitic plutons uh, to the surface. Now, you can go to Yellowstone Park and you can actually see another tectonic setting where continental lithosphere can begin to melt. Here it's slightly different. In Yellowstone Park, we have a hot spot that underlies this area uh, of Wyoming. The basaltic magma that's created at the hot spot rises up through the continental crust and begins to partly melt it. As it partly melts, this magma will start to rise. Well, what's different here than, say, the Appalachian Mountains is that this magma, this partial melt of the, of the continental crust, as it begins to rise, it reaches the surface. So it crystallizes at the surface. And so it forms a composition of lava that is identical to the granitoid magma that crystallized beneath the Appalachian Mountains. And it forms the rock type rhyolite. In this case, rhyolite tuff. I'll talk about tuff a little bit later. Okay, but clearly it is the equivalent composition of granite. It's just that it crystallizes uh, more rapid at the surface. Here you can see, as you remember, we talked about viscosity properties of rhyolite. Viscosity is the lava type that has the highest viscosity. You'll note here it has a very steep front to the flow. It's almost vertical. That flow is very thick and sluggish, you can see, uh, as it was uh, flowing out uh, from the Yellowstone caldera. Okay, so those are the three different compositional forms of the magmas or lava types that you're going to be looking at today that define uh, the igneous rocks. Now, I want to look a little bit closer at actual composition, the minerals that comprise igneous rocks. This is Bowen's reaction series chart, and I discuss this in lecture, but just to reiterate, what the most important aspects to get out of this Bowen's reaction series chart is that certain minerals will crystallize okay, at similar temperatures. Let me put this circle this in dark so you can see it better. And so if we look at this up here in the red zone, the minerals up here, olivine, calcium rich plagioclase, and pyroxene, all will tend to crystallize at higher temperatures. In the intermediate, these would be our subduction zones. You're going to find these minerals present in andesite and diorite. Remember, basalt gabbro is uh, the higher temperature. Andesite diorite is the intermediate temperatures. And this is comprised of amphibole, sodium rich plagioclase, your, some of your micas, and maybe a little bit of potassium rich feldspar. When you get down to your lower melting temperature, your partial melt of continental crust, you're going to have largely uh, magmas are derived from quartz, potassium-rich feldspar, and your micas, and maybe some sodium-rich plagioclase. And so here we see again your three compositional forms of magma, your three compositional characteristics of igneous rocks. Basalt gabbro, andesite diorite, rhyolite, granite. And remember, dacite and granodiorite would fall somewhere in between andesite and rhyolite. Now, you might ask, well, what does this term here, continuous series and discontinuous series? Now, remember, I address this in lecture, but just to reiterate, because this is a little bit more confusing or complex, let's just make sure we understand this. The conti continuous reaction series, part of the Bowen's uh, chart, is between calcium-rich plagioclase and sodium-rich plagioclase. Remember what I mentioned in the lecture, that with this continuous reaction series, 
calcium and sodium can ionically exchange for one another uh, in the minerals as it is crystallizing. So as long as the melt phase is in contact with the solid phase, the crystals, you can have ionic substitution of sodium atoms replacing calcium atoms. Now, if it's a higher temperature magma, you're going to largely get the calcium rich phase crystallizing first. And if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you separate the calcium rich phase early on, okay, from that melt phase, then your rock is going to have more calcium rich plagioclase in it. But if it stays in contact, they can continue to ionic exchange with one another. Now, as you, early on, as you bring out the calcium rich phase, the residual magma that gets separated will be more enriched in sodium. So in later phases of crystallization, you're going to tend to have a higher proportion of sodium-rich plagioclase crystals. Now keep in mind, very important, this is continuous. You can have any combination or proportionality of calcium to sodium in your magma. Okay, Higher temperatures will tend to be higher in calcium-rich, lower temperatures higher in sodium-rich but they will ionically substitute for one another. In this crystal you can see here, which we, you can look at this closer on your own time, what you'll note here is that this plagioclase crystal is zoned. And you'll note that the, if, you, if you look at this here, you'll see that on the interior here, you will see that the calcium-rich plagioclase, the more calcium-rich phase, that it crystallized first, and the more sodium-rich in the outer zone of this uh, plagioclase crystal showing that it was constantly ionically substituting and you had a whole range of compositional forms of this plagioclase. Now the discontinuous reaction series, as I mentioned in lecture, is an either or situation. That we start out here with our partial melt of the asthenosphere. And as the magma starts to crystallize, the first minerals that start to crystallize out are the olivine with iron magnesium and the silicate structure. And as that magma continues to cool, you'll start to then get pyroxene crystallizing out. And remember, I said it's an either-or situation. You can have olivine crystallizing out, and then as the temperature reduces, then pyroxene. Olivine and pyroxene for a period of time can crystallize together. But there's no hybrid mineral or any ionic substitution between the olivine structure and the pyroxene structure. It's an either-or situation. Those minerals can form together in the rock, but they're individual minerals. And as you see here, when we look under polarized light, you can see here distinct crystal boundaries. The early formed olivine, and then surrounding this here in the gray, the later formed pyroxene crystal. So it's discontinuous. And then you can go on down through pyroxene and amphibole, the pyroxene and amphibole and the micas, and you can go on down through that discontinuous reaction series and get progressively the lower melting temperature minerals starting to... Uh, crystallize out uh, as the magma begins to cool and you separate the melt phase from the solid phase. Now you might ask yourself, how do we fraction it? How do we separate magmas? How do we get the different composition of igneous rocks? If, they, if the melt phase stays in contact with the solid phase, you're going to get this sort of ionic substitution and this, often this exchange. But what happens, of course, is we can separate the solid phase from the melt phase. You can actually have minerals form, they become denser, they can settle out onto the bottom of the magma chamber, as shown here. You can also have convection cells in the magma chamber, and the minerals can sort of stick to the, the uh, upper chamber walls. And there you can separate the solid phase from the melt phase. You can actually have, uh, you know, sort of constrictions where the melt can move out and you can have it, these concentration of crystals move with it. And so there you can separate the melt phase and the solid phase. The most important thing to remember here, when you separate the melt phase from the solid phase, the solid phase will always be comprised of higher melting temperature minerals than the melt phase. Remember, we've always, we kept addressing this. Partial melting of the asthenosphere. The melt phase that melts is going to have slightly more silica. It's going to be a lower melting temperature than the solid phase that stays behind. We're always going melt phase more silica rich, Solid phase, more iron, magnesium rich, relatively speaking. Okay, very important. You can also separate magmas by starting out with a solid rock, heat it up, and then start to have it undergo partial melting. Then what's going to happen, the lower melting temperatures would melt first, 
you'd separate the melt phase from the solid phase and have two different compositions of rock. As the melt phase crystallizes, uh, it's going to be more silica rich than the solid phase that never melted, that remained of the higher melting temperature minerals. Okay? Fractionation or separation by fractional crystallization or starting out with a rock and under basically fractionation, fractionating by partial melting. Now, this diagram here really shows clearly what we've been addressing with Bones reaction series and this fractionation process. We start out with a magmatic melt, okay, here in the partial melt of the stenosphere. Note that if you look here, we have iron magnesium, we have calcium, we have aluminum, we have sodium, potassium, and silica, all different color coordinated. When we start to crystallize out early on, what's going to happen here is you're going to tend to have higher concentrations of iron magnesium and your silicate structures and calcium. And so your mafic and your alter mafic are going to be comprised largely of iron magnesium and then calcium starts to add into this uh, forming your calcium rich plagioclase and in your pyroxene, your basalt. And, but what's going to happen here, the melt phase that stays behind is going to get progressively more and more enriched in silica, aluminum and your lighter elements, sodium and potassium. So by the time we go through the fractionation process of separating your melts, excuse me, your solids from your melts, by the time we get to that residual melt and that partial melt of continental crust, it's going to be largely comprised of silicon and oxygen, uh, some aluminum and iron, excuse me, not iron, sodium and potassium, your lighter elements. And so it makes sense the minerals that make up your granite or your rhyolite are only going to be comprised of these elements that remain behind. These are your lighter elements and are going to form your lower density minerals and your lighter colored minerals like sodium rich plagioclase, potassium feldspar, muscovite, mica, and quartz. Now, we now understand how we fractionate. We know how we separate melt phases from solid phases and how the mineral, certain minerals are compatible that will form together at certain freezing or melting temperatures. Now you're ready to classify igneous rocks. And so I mentioned this igneous rock chart in lecture and I said it will be on the exam. And so I'm not giving it away. It's not like, oh, geez, what a cakewalk. All I'm telling you, if you understand this igneous rock chart, then you'll understand how to classify igneous rocks. Note the same thing that showed with Bones reaction series, that if we look at this igneous rock chart, you'll note that in this area right here, let me put it in black so we can see it, okay, that is your granite rhyolite zone. We come over here, this is your andesite diorite zone, your intermediate composition, and over here is your mafic, basalt, gabbro, and over here is your ultramafic, your asthenosphere rock, which is largely olivine. Now, the way that we classify igneous rocks is we simply look at the mineral compositions. To read this chart, it is basically based on the percent volume of these minerals. And you can read over here, each of these units is 20%. So the way to read this, if we look at this rock X right here and go straight down and look at its composition, you're going to see that there's quartz in it, potassium feldspar, sodium-rich plagioclase, and some biotite mica, and maybe a little bit of amphibole. And this is an ideal composition rock. Okay? We'll note that it falls in the granite rhyolite composition. And the way to determine the percentages here is remember each of these units represents 20%. So granite, excuse me, this granite rhyolite, you note there there's 20%, there's 20% quartz and another 10%, so there's 30% quartz in this uh, part of this rock diagram. Down here we might have 40% or 50% potassium feldspar. And so we've gone through this. You can read this diagram. The bottom line is when you're looking at what's in a granite, there is quartz, potassium feldspar, sodium rich plagioclase, and maybe a little bit of muscovite or biotite mica, and perhaps amphibole. And you can do the same thing with basalt coming over here. It's largely pyroxene, calcium rich plagioclase, and maybe some olivine in it. And if you think about it, what minerals, if you have a, a basalt, what minerals will form the phenocrist? What, if you have a phenocrist, a porphyritic basalt, what mineral is going to form the phenocrist? It's going to be the highest melting temperature mineral. What mineral is the highest melting temperature mineral in basalt? Well, the highest melting temperature mineral goes as we move towards the right. It's going to be your olivine. So olivine will form the phenocrist in your basalt. 
If you're looking at granite or rhyolite, what's going to be your, your phenocrysts in your uh, rhyolite? Well, maybe it's amphibole. Or maybe it's biotite that has your higher melting temperature. Okay? Now, the last thing we want to look at here is the rocks themselves. So when you're going to look today, you're going to classify your igneous rocks. We've got the three compositional characteristics. Remember, basalt gabbro, diorite andesite. Okay, and let's just put this here. Okay, the coarse grained equivalent is, bas excuse me, fine grained equivalent is basalt. The fine grained equivalent of this is andesite. And the fine grained equivalent of this is rhyolite. And remember, for you Mount St. Helens buffs, you have grano diorite is the coarse grained equivalent of the intermediate rock that's right in between here. And dacite is the fine grained equivalent or porphyritic. Because remember, volcanic rocks can be porphyritic. And so you will go through today and you will look at the different igneous rocks. So here we can see that's very easy. If you can see the minerals of your naked eye, it's a coarse grained igneous rocks. Now, what is it? Well, you can go to your rock ID chart in the uh, appendix of your lab and you're going to see, okay, I can see this really clear. Let me put that in dark. That is potassium feldspar, the pink feldspar. I can also see the quartz. The question is, I'm not quite sure what that dark mineral is. I'm going to give you a little clue of how to be able to identify these dark minerals or maybe minerals you don't know. So I've got a piece of granite here. Now it's not going to be perfect, okay, but you can get an idea. I'd like to show you this on a flat surface, but for the purpose of this lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this granite and I'm going to go to the dark mineral. You can already know the, fel the potassium feldspar. It's pink. It's really clear. You can see the quartz, but what's the dark mineral? Well, the dark mineral could be one of three minerals. It could be amphibole, okay, amphibole. It could be pyroxene, or it could be biotite, the flaky biotite, the sheet silicate, the mica. Well, what you can do is come to your rock, take a harder a probe, say the number eight or number six, go to your hard mineral on a sheet of paper, put lay it flat, but for now to show you on the film, I'm just going to, I'm going to flake it. I'm going to start to break that bark mineral off. Now you can't see it, I apologize, uh, because of the details here. But what flaked off here were little tiny golden black sheets. Right away, that tells me the dark mineral in that granite was biotite, because it's the only sheet mineral that breaks off in sheets. Now what happens if the mineral, if it didn't break off in sheets? What happens if it, it didn't, it stayed in the prismatic crystal form? That leaves us with amphibole and pyroxene. Now this is my little cheat sheet to remind you. We do this all the time. Okay? I just want to back up here again to take you to the chart. Okay? And if we look at the, the ID chart here, the mineral ID chart, if you go to your granite, and so you have a dark mineral that is not flaky, that comes off in sheets, that leaves you with a choice of amphibole or pyroxene. Well, based on the presence of the pink potassium feldspar, which of the dark minerals is more likely going to be compatible with it? Well, it's going to be the amphibole. So even if you can't see the cleavage planes, you'd be probably correct to surmise that that dark mineral that doesn't break off in the little sheets is amphibole because you have potassium feldspar. So use the compatibility of minerals to help you maybe identify sometimes minerals that you don't know, like phenocris and so forth. Okay, what minerals are compatible with one another? And if it's a phenocris, what minerals are compatible with one another? Which one of those has the higher melting temperature that would most likely be the phenocris? Okay? All right. So just going back, today you're going to look at basalt, uh, the fine-grained igneous rocks. We always say, don't use color to identify rocks. Then we say, use color. Basalt is a dark black massive rock. Sometimes you might see some phenocrysts in it. You might see some uh, plagioclase crystals uh, or uh, the little whitish gray ones. Or maybe you might see small little green olivine crystals in it. You get to andesite. You're going to see the dark uh, little crystal there. Well, you go to andesite. What minerals is it most likely going to be? It doesn't flake off like a sheet silicate as mica. Well, then it's probably going to be amphibole. And then you, the big white crystal is going to be plagioclase forming the phenocrysts. Rhyolite, you can see, is kind of a gray buff colored. Uh, obsidian forms, it's different. We have some special uh, textures with igneous rocks. The glassy textured one that breaks off in conchoidal fractures that looks black in a, in a thick section 
is actually a very, it's a volcanic glass and it's pure silica and that's why it breaks off concordly. What makes obsidian dark? Trace amounts of magnetite. It just looks dark in a thick section. Other specialized igneous textures. Subigneous uh, rocks form with high gas content. Those gas bubbles are preserved. If it's a felsic content one, one that is equivalent to rhyolite or granite, we call it pumice. If it's a mafic or intermediate, we call it scoria. And actually, it's kind of cool. You guys can see here. Look at, there's some olivine phenocrysts you can see in that scoria. It's got that green color diagnostic of olivine. Sometimes you have very explosive volcanic eruptions and that ash and that coarse uh, volcanic clastic material, it can weld together. And that will form a volcanic tuff if it's fine grained ash that's welded together. This is the Bishop Tuff down in uh, Eastern California. Uh, and then if it's really coarse grained volcanic class that uh, are welded together, such as this tuff that you see uh, in Lapari Island in Italy, uh, you're going to have much coarser uh, class and some of these are going to be cobbles to boulder size. This is a volcanic breccia. The last thing I want to mention to you guys that, you know, that will not take much more of your time is the fact that the composition of the magma is going to have a very strong control on its viscosity, which is going to have a very strong control on its morphology of the volcano. And so you're going to look at uh, Hawaiian volcanoes, you're going to look at Cascade volcanoes, you're going to notice the Hawaiian volcanoes have very low slope angles. And why do they have low slope angles? Because of the low viscosity of basalt flows here. You'll see that this might have only about a, oops, a seven degree slope angle that you can see here. Okay, about seven degrees, very gently sloping. Okay. And then just let me move along here. I apologize here. There we go. And then finally, uh, we can look at the Cascades or the Aleutian Islands subduction zone volcanoes. Note here, if you look at their slope angle, you'll see that they make slope angles of 25 to 35 degrees, large because of the pyroclastic and lava flows of the andesites have a much uh, higher viscosity, so they can retain much deeper slope angles, and the volcanoes reflect that. Along that same line of thinking, if you're looking at the explosivity of the volcanic eruptions, why do the Hawaiian Island eruptions, why are they so quiescent or quiet and gentle? You can stand right beside the lava fountains. Be because basalt has a low viscosity, has relatively low gas content, so the lava fountains get erupted and uh, the gas is released easily, gently. And then when you come down to look at a Mount St. Helens or a subduction zone uh, volcano, there you have relatively high viscosity intermediate lavas with high gas content. That's not a good combination. Thick, viscous lavas, high gas content. Gas is expanding as the lava is upwelling or rising. Very explosive. And so that sort of gives you an overview of what you'll be doing uh, this week in laboratory. Uh, anyway, I'll see you next week when we talk about sedimentary rocks and processes. And you all have a good day.